Thank you very much, and welcome to tonight's Bach talk. <laughs> it is a great pleasure to be back here at Music at Menlo. I've enjoyed my last couple of experiences here over the past couple of summers. It really has been the highlight of my summers, and it is wonderful to see you all again. I wanted to start this conversation about late Bach, the musical offering, the art of fugue, with what may strike you as a kind of a non sequitur, which is do any of you recognize this image that you've been looking at since you came into the hall this evening? Some of you do. For those of you who don't, it is Bach's self-designed monogram. It exists on his seal, which he used for his legal papers, for his private correspondence. It also ap appears on this so-called Bach goblet, which is the only authentic piece of household possession that we have of Bach. It's on exhibit in the Eisenach Museum in Germany. You don't really have to know anything about this image in order to enjoy looking at it. But I think that the more you do know about its interlocking components and possible levels of religious symbolism, the more you'll enjoy looking at it. For instance, have you noticed yet that it consists of two interlocking versions of his initials JSB? Can you see that? Let me break it apart for you so you can see it. There's JSB running laterally from upper left to lower right. And then running laterally from upper right to lower left is JSB in mirror image. And as we work our way through the components of the musical offering and the art of fugue, you will find that this is a very Bachian thing to do. <laughs> also, the point at which these two long curvy S's intersect forms a cross. Or if you prefer, it's the Greek letter chi, either way, standing for Christ, and probably a subliminal message to us that Christ was the ruler of Bach's life. And reinforcing this message is this crown of Christ the King hovering above it all. And if we look at it, we notice that there are many components that we can scrutinize. We notice that there are jewels in the crown, and there are various elements hovering above the jewels. In the center, we have this trefoil element, which I think is designed to subliminally remind us of the trefoil elements and the stone tracery around the tops of cathedrals and to represent, perhaps, the Trinity. If we go back to the jewels in the crown, we count them up, we discover that there are 12, which could represent the 12 disciples of Christ. In the upper tier, there are seven, which could represent the seven last words on the cross. In the body of the crown, there are five, which could be the five stigmata of Christ on the cross. Or I could be completely wrong about all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious to find out what other interpretations have been ascribed to the Bach monogram, so I went to the source. I Google searched it. and. <laughs> And I turned up a few different interpretations. One of the more intriguing ones was by an obsessive musicologist who is persuaded that these jewels and other elements in the crown represent Bach's well-tempered tuning system. <laughs> and he appended a rather long article full of all kinds of mathematical support for his contentions. I read it. I couldn't understand it. The point of all of this is that there's something about the mind of Bach, whether we apply it to a piece of graphic art that he invented or to his often punning wordplay, as we will see in the introduction to the musical offering, or of course in the music itself, that encourages and invites beneath the surface exploration, contemplation, examination. Because with Bach, there's always another level to be plumbed. And that really is the theme of tonight's conversation. And I hope that by the end of this two-hour journey into the mind of Bach, that you will feel that you 
have a bit more appreciation for the intricacy of his thinking, particularly as it applies to contrapuntal music that he wrote over the course of his, of his life. To give you an overview of what to expect tonight, this conversation will be divided into two segments, each approximately an hour in length. The first half will be about the musical offering, the events leading up to it, and I will talk a bit about uh, the components of the musical offering, and then we will take 10 minutes. When we come back, we will talk exclusively about the art of fugue, and that will be a little more technical because in the same way that I just deconstructed Bach's monogram for you, I would like to give you a sense of the general constructing principles of some of the fugues, some of the canons, so that you have an orientation or if you prefer a kind of an appetizer for this uh, multi-course meal that we're all going to experience on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings in Stent Hall when we get to hear the entire Art of Fugue performed by Orion String Quartet and Windscape Woodwind Quintet in beautiful arrangement by Samuel Barron. As an avenue into the workings of Bach's musical mind, I'd like to start by talking about three short canons that he wrote. This word canon comes from the Greek for rule or law, and canons really are the strictest form of counterpoint, much more strict and rule-bound than fugues, which are really a kind of a process as opposed to a, uh, a form. But canons obey certain thou shalts and thou shalt nots of uh, canonic law. And of course, we all know canons from our earliest childhood because we sang rounds as children, row, row, row your boat, Frere Jaca. And these are the simplest kinds of unison canons. You have, of course, a line that starts, then the second line comes in at the unison, at the remove of one bar, and it replicates exactly what the first line is doing, and somehow, miraculously, they create counterpoint and they create harmony with each other. But as I say, this is the simplest kind of canon. They can be constructed in all shapes and sizes and levels of intricacy. The second voice can be constructed to work at an interval other than the unison. It can be constructed to work in inversion from the first voice. It can run in contrary motion to the first voice. It can be a different rhythmic proportion of the first voice, which is to say it can move twice as quickly or half as slowly. And all of these permutations can be layered on top of each other in increasingly complicated contrapuntal designs, as we will see in the musical offering and the art of fugue. This picture of Bach is probably familiar to most of you. It's the most authentic portrait we have of Bach. It was painted in 1746 by the Saxon court portrait artist whose name was Elias Hausmann. And it was painted for a very specific event, which was his inauguration, I believe in 1747, into a very exclusive scholarly society called the Corresponding Society of Musical Sciences was formed by a one-time student of Bach named Lorenz Miesler, who was a polymath professor. He was a composer, he was a mathematician, scientist, a philosopher. And in the spirit of Johannes Kepler and going back to Pythagoras, he believed in the music of the spheres theories. He believed that the mathematical and scientific principles governing the workings of music are related to or perhaps the same as those governing the working of the universe at large. And so he formed this society and he invited the luminaries of the German musical establishment to be members. And so this society included the likes of Handel and Telemann and from 1747 Bach himself. And a prerequisite for joining the society was that you agreed that every year until you turned 65, you would contribute an appropriately learned piece of music to Miesler's society that would in one way or another support his contentions. And as you notice in this portrait, Bach is carrying a piece of music in his hand. 
And this is the piece that he dedicated to the Corresponding Society of Visual Sciences, I believe in the second year of his membership in 1748. And if we turn it up so we can see what it is, we discover that it is the six-voice canon, the triplex canon, which is confusing because we look at it, we see three voices. It is in fact what they call a puzzle canon, which means that you have to figure it out. You've got to unpack it in order to understand how it works in six voices. In fact, it is the 13th of 14 puzzle canons that Bach wrote on this baseline, which is the ground or the baseline to the first eight bars of the aria on which the Goldberg variations are based. It goes, so, fa, mi, re, si, do, re, so. And each of these 14 canons becomes more and more intricate. They start out with the simplex canon, which is very simple indeed. It looks like the piece of music that I just sang for you. But he gives us certain hints about how to solve it. As you will see, he gives us the bass clef at the beginning. He gives us one sharp for G major, two, four. And at the end, we see in inversion that same array of clef, key signature, and meter. That Again, that Bachian inversion. And it tells us that what we're looking at is a musical palindrome. It's a piece that can be read this way. It can be read that way. And it can be layered on top of each other so that it sounds like this. <laughs> It's what they call a perpetual motion cannon. It's also, you can call this a crab cannon because crabs scuttle sideways this way or they scuttle sideways that way. Now, if we return to this triplex cannon, in order to solve it, we have to look at what he gives us. Three lines of music, each consisting of three bars of, of music. We have three different clefs, alto, tenor, bass clef. We have a key signature. The second and the third bars are meant to be repeated. And there's a sign over the top of the second bar which tells us that when the first bar gets to that point, the second bar, that means the second voice, comes in at that point. And from that point, we've got to figure it out. If we stare at it long enough, we discuss, discover that each of these three voices can be performed along with itself in inversion, upside down. But it won't work if we turn it upside down at the interval of a unison. Eventually, we discover that these three lines have to be inverted at different intervals. So the first one inverts at the fifth. So, fa, mi, re, si, do, re, so. Inverted at the fifth is re, mi, fa, so, si, la, so, re. And the second line is so, la, do, si, la, so. Inverted at the fifth is re, do, la, si, do, re. And the top line is re, mi, fa, so, mi, re, do, si, do, re. And if you invert that at the fourth, it's so, fa, mi, re, fa, so, la, si, la, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really, it's nothing. I went to Juilliard. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> if I show you all the lines that I just sang to you, there's your six-voice canon. And if you're curious to hear how it sounds when it is played from the bottom up. <laughs> Neither the simplex nor the triplex canon are really fully fledged pieces of music. 
they're more like little contrapuntal wind-up toys, you know, that you can set into motion and let wander around the room until you get tired of listening to them. You could consider them, I think, to be the building blocks of contrapuntal musical life. They are contrapuntal organic compounds. And it is this kind of building block that he used to construct living, breathing musical life forms in the musical offering and the art of fugue. And here's one of them. This one is called the Crab Cannon. And if we study it, we notice it comes from the musical offering. So it's based on the so-called royal theme, which we will get to in about 15 or 20 minutes, but here's a preview of it. It is basically a very intricate version of the simplex canon that we just looked at, which is to say if we follow the hints that he's given us, we see at the beginning and at the end we have going in different directions, clef, key signature, and meter. That tells us that it can be gone this way, it can go that way, and as you remember, it can be layered on top of each other. I have a little graphic animation here by a Belgian graphic artist named Jos Lace that I think will amuse you and will make this point rather clearly. fun too. And I'm sure that for Bach, writing and solving puzzle canons was fun. <laughs> but of course it was much more than fun. For Bach, canons I believe were windows into the contrapuntal laws of musical creation. And for him, counterpoint of all kinds, canons, fugues, polyphony in general, was the highest form of musical creation. And the form of music that afforded the most elevated kind of spiritual expression. But in his lifetime, and particularly accelerating toward the end of his life, this polyphonic, intricate style of music making fell seriously out of favor. And Bach gradually began to see himself as in danger of being deleted from the catalog. Uh, people were looking to create and listen to music which was more homophonic in texture, melody, accompaniment, simple, accessible. They didn't want to solve puzzle canons. They didn't want to peer into the intricacy of ancient sounding polyphony. They wanted music that you could understand on first hearing music that sounded more like this. Mm -hmm. 
pleasant, pointedly non contrapuntal piece of 18th century elevator music <laughs> was composed by a gentleman named Johann Adolf Scheibe, who was a one time student of Bach, who in 1737 had become quite well known as a composer, as a music theorist, and as a scholarly writer on musical matters. He had even started his own scholarly journal called Musical Criticism. And in that journal, in 1737, he wrote, I should say perhaps he unleashed a broadside against Bach and his contrapuntal style of music making. To give you a, an example, the great man would be the admiration of whole nations if he had more amenity. If he did not take away from the natural element in his pieces by giving them a turgid and confused style. And if he did not darken their beauty by an excess of art. <laughs> Turgidity has led him from the natural to the artificial, from the lofty to the somber. While one admires the onerous labor and the uncommon effort, these are vainly employed since they conflict with nature. <laughs> Knowing from our perspective what happened to Bach's reputation and to Scheibe's reputation, <laughs> we kind of wish that Bach had had the ability to simply ignore this example of 18th century blog trollery <laughs> and to simply go his separate way. But this was not Bach's nature. He was not the sort of man who turns the other cheek in a fight. He could be positively pugilistic when he felt that his honor had been besmirched and that he personally had been dissed. <laughs> and so he engaged a rhetoric professor named Abraham Birnbaum to respond on his behalf. And Birnbaum unleashed an oraton blast of counter rhetoric uh, in which he dissected all of Scheibe's article arguments and he responded to them individually. And of course, Scheibe then unleashed another blast. And this went back tediously for about two years. <laughs> Finally, it was still resonating uh, maybe six or seven years later. And again, one wishes that Bach had simply had the perspective that we have and had ignored it. In fact, because he had already responded, I think, very effectively and entertainingly in, I believe it was 1729, to this whole battle between the learned high style of contrapuntal music making and this simpler homophonic, more, as Bach would have it, simple-minded style of fashionable music making that was taking hold. He had become the head of a concert series in Leipzig, a secular concert series called the Collegium Musicum, which met at a place called Zimmermann's Coffee Shop. And he wrote as an inaugural offering for that a cantata, a secular cantata called the competition between Pan and Phoebus, or perhaps it's Phoebus and Pan. In this cantata, Phoebus is the king of the gods. He is also known as Apollo. And he represents Bach's favored style of learned contrapuntal music making. Pan, the god of nature, is the other side of the equation. And it starts with a long 10 minute poignant aria in B minor by Phoebus himself. And as you'll see, he couches this beautiful lament on love and death written about the death of his lover Hyacinth in six or seven voices of interactive contrapuntal music, beautifully orchestrated, all kinds of interesting imitative features between the voices and echo effects. Let me play you about 90 seconds of this aria by Phoebus. <laughs> 
it's, uh, and as you hear, he has just pulled out all the stops to represent this emotionally rich, contrapuntally sophisticated style of music that he is defending, that he is representing as his own. And then Pan has a crack at it. And Pan's music is about uh, not love and death, it's about the joys of dancing and leaping around. And as you'll see, it's couched in two vaguely interactive lines of rather homophonic music. <laughs> Bestes Tun und mich noch herrlicher als Phoebus halten. Probably a side of Bach you didn't know existed. <laughs> and with this playfully oafish assault on the fashionable style of music, as I say, Bach had pretty well handled this issue. And he liked this cantata a lot. He tended to pull it out whenever he felt himself to be particularly under attack. Uh, in 1749, that was the last time he had it performed, the year before he passed away. And he played it in response to yet another attack by the town authorities and by the St. Thomas School authorities. They had actually auditioned for his successor before he had died. And he was, as you would imagine, insulted and he pulled it out and he replaced some of the names with names that would make fun of the people who had, you know, come after him. Over the last 15 or 20 years of his life living in Leipzig, he was often under attack for his increasingly out of fashion musical style, also over the allocation of funds and over the allocation of good singers. And he grew tired of this, uh, you know, just this constant battling with the pettifogging bureaucrats of the time became wearisome for him. And he began to retreat from all of this and it had an effect on the style of his music over the last 10 years of his life. He began to recycle his sacred cantatas. He wrote a handful of them in the last 10 years of his life, but he had written hundreds of them earlier and he could just recycle them as needed. He left the employment of the uh, Zimmermann's coffee shop and he uh, stopped writing orchestral suites and those kinds of pieces. And over the last 10 years of his life, he began to devote himself to the kind of music that was almost determinedly unfashionable. Uh, he began to write pieces like the second book of the well-tempered clavier the Goldberg variations, the musical offering, the art of fugue. It was as if he was saying to the Scheibes of the world, I, I don't care what you think. This isn't about being fashionable. This is about musical truth. And so it was in that context that on the evening of May the 7th, 1747, he showed up at the glittering palace of King Frederick the Great, who was just preparing to perform his own flute concertos with his illustrious band of court musicians. 
good for a king, wouldn't you say? He was not only um, one of the great military commanders of, of the day, of all time, and military tacticians, but he was also a highly cultured man, and he surrounded himself with the finest musicians, artists, philosophers, scientists, mathematicians of the day. The language of this glittering court at Potsdam was French. Uh, he didn't really like speaking German. And he carried on a long correspondence with Voltaire himself. And as you hear, he was a very fine musician. He played the flute quite well. And he also was uh, well known as a composer. And as you hear, the kind of music he wrote was in this up-to-date Rococo style of music making that was fashionable. He really did not like uh, the kind of music that Bach made, this intricate, complicated, contrapuntal style of music. Bach, of course, liked the flute as well, wrote quite a lot of flute music. And I'll give you a sample of what his flute music tended to sound like. That's the third movement of Bach's great sonata for, in B minor for flute and harpsichord. As you hear, it is a three-part fugue. And as such, it represents the antithesis of the kind of music that King Frederick liked to play and to hear on the flute. There are differing, differing tastes in flute music. It really only scratches the surface of the differences in their ideologies, in their warring cultural values. When they met in 1747, Bach was 62, and he was the father of this waning high school of the Baroque music making. And the king was 35, and he was a son of this burgeoning enlightenment and enlightened style of Rococo music making. Bach was a religiously pious man, a Lutheran, he uh, had had 20 children with two successive wives by this time. The king was 35. He was uh, a lapsed Calvinist. He was a religious skeptic in the style of the day. Uh, he was probably homosexual. He had no children. He was locked into a loveless political marriage. And for Bach, music was this intensely spiritual way of glorifying God. And for the king, music was a very human enterprise aimed at entertainment and uh, diversion. So in many ways, they were completely on the opposite ends of the human, the musical, and the ideological spectrum. And you may wonder, well, why did Bach go to visit him at all? And the answer to that is that the king had invited, which is to say, commanded Bach to come, because not that he was interested in hearing Bach's style of music making, but Bach had a great reputation as being the greatest organist and improviser of the day, and the king was curious to hear this for himself. And so he had sent out repeated invitations to Bach, and Bach had finessed them because there were political reasons not to go. Uh, the Prussian troops had occupied Leipzig, where Bach lived for about a year as a part of the king's adventures in Silesia, and they had finally withdrawn, so that gave Bach the political cover to go up as an act of diplomacy. But he also had personal reasons for going because he had a grandson that had just been born to his second son, Carl Philip Emanuel. And Carl Philip Emanuel was the king's keyboard player and a very, very fine composer in his own right in this Rococo style of music, which was quite popular. And really, by this time in their lives, Carl Philip Emanuel's music was much more popular than Bach's because it was much more up to date. He was not the only musical luminary in the King's stable of musicians. His Kapellmeister was a gentleman named Karl Heinrich Grun, who was the leading composer of the stylish form of Italian opera that was popular in Germany at that time. And the King's flute teacher was 
Johann Joachim Quantz, who we flute players remember as the man who literally wrote the book on flute playing. He wrote a book called On Playing the Flute, <laughs> which most of us still have in our libraries. Very fine composer of flute music. And the concertmaster of the King's Orchestra was the Bohemian violinist and violin composer Franz Benda. So these are a few of the luminaries who were waiting for Bach when he arrived on May 7th. And his arrival was news. It made the papers. And there are a number of contemporary accounts of his arrival there in Potsdam. Here's one of them. Just as the king was getting his flute ready and his musicians were assembled, an officer brought him the written list of the strangers who had arrived. With his flute in his hand, he ran over the list but immediately turned to the assembled musicians and said with a kind of agitation, gentlemen, old Bach is come. The flute was now laid aside, and old Bach, who had alighted at his son's lodging, was immediately summoned to the palace. And so we have this image of Bach, fresh from his two days in a coach, being jounced around over rough roads. He's come to visit his son, he's kicked off his boots, he's put up his feet, he may have, maybe has a beer in his hand. And the king's emissary arrives and says, the king is waiting for you, you must go to the palace now. So Bach pulls his boots back on, goes to the palace. There are these luminaries, there's the king himself. The king greets him, takes him by the arm, and begins to escort him around his palace because he wants to show him his many examples of the newfangled Gottfried Zilbermann forte piano. This is one of the, the king's forte pianos. I think that's his flute on the lid of it. And Bach already knew something about these forte pianos because Gottfried Zilbermann was a great organ builder of the day and he had approached Bach and asked him to examine one of the prototypes. Bach had done that. Zilbermann had asked him for his opinion. Bach had given it to him which had hurt Zilbermann's feelings, but he had the smarts to incorporate what Bach had told him into the design of the instrument. And so now Bach had 15 of them to try out and see whether or not his suggestions had had a salutary effect on their action and on their sound. So he was contentedly trying these instruments out when the king himself sat down at one of them and he said, Herr Bach, I have a theme of my own that I'd like to play for you. It sounds like this. And then the king said, I'd like to see if you can improvise a three-part fugue on this theme. Now a few words about the royal theme. A good fugue theme, as we'll see in the Art of Fugue, is one that is open to contrapuntal manipulation and that can be modified easily. This one, by contrast, is a contrapuntal obstacle course with this long row of descending chromatics and its accel accelerating note values, probably designed as a diabolical plot to embarrass Bach in front of his contemporaries. And I know that sounds like paranoid musicians, conspiracy theory. <laughs> but we have it on good authority that the king enjoyed nothing more than the mean-spirited baiting of his guests. And we have that on the authority of Voltaire himself, who, as I say, knew the king well. And he described his personality this way. When Frederick says, you are my friend. He means, you are my slave. <laughs> when he calls you, my dear friend, he means, you mean less than nothing to me. <laughs> and when he says, come to dinner, he means, I feel like making fun of you tonight. <laughs> and we also have a description of this royal theme, which corroborates this theory from Arnold Schoenberg, 200 years later, who really called it contrapuntally unsuitable and canonically perverse. And he said, 
It's a theme that resisted Johann Sebastian's versatility and went on to say whether Carl Philip Emanuel led the king astray or whether the joke was ordered by the king himself can only be proven psychologically, which is an interesting comment because we remember that Schoenberg was a product of Freud's Vienna and he seems to be casting this jaundiced Oedipal eye on Carl Philip Emanuel as the possible source of this theme, <laughs> assuming that the king didn't really have the compositional sophistication to fashion such a contrapuntally bulletproof theme himself. <laughs> it really sounds like, you know, the makings of another Dan Brown novel. It's a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> call it the Emanuel Code. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, this theme did not present any problems for Bach in improvising the three-part fugue that the king had requested. And if you're like me, you may have wondered from time to time, what did it sound like when Bach improvised? Or for that matter, Mozart or Beethoven or Chopin. These great composers who were also legendary improvisers and whose improvised music just evaporated into the ether. In the case of this three-part fugue, we actually know what it sounded like because when he got back later that week to Leipzig, he sat down and he wrote it down for memory. And so I'll play you the first 90 seconds of this six minute fugue. And this is, I think we can assume very close to what it was that he performed for the king and for his assembled musicians on the evening of May 7th, 1747. It's an interesting piece because as you hear, it starts out like a classic fugue. You have the theme itself by itself. Then you have it come in in the dominant in G minor. Then you have it come in again in the tonic in C minor in the bass. Then you have what's called an episode where we don't hear the theme. Then we have a fragment of the theme in the bass line. And in the right hand, he gives us this swaggering set of triplets, this flourish of very pre-classical sounding music, uh, very stylish. And then he begins to combine this swaggering triplet figure with his own, the king's own theme. And so what Bach is doing here is very cleverly on the spur of the moment, combining his preferred learned style of music making with the Bach's up-to-date and forward-looking style of music making. And you can only imagine how awestruck the musicians were when they heard him do this because when the king played this tune for him, they must have been thinking to themselves, oh my God, <laughs> what's he going to do with this? And to hear him dispatch it with such ease and to even make it appeal to the king was astonishing. And so they gathered around and they congratulated him and patted him on the back. But the king was not so easily defeated. And so he thanked Bach for the three-part fugue and then he said, now, Herr Bach, I'd like you to improvise a six-part fugue based on this same theme. Now, a few words about six-part fugues. In all 48 preludes and fugues of the well-tempered clavier, there are no six-part fugues. There's one in five parts. And so, by asking Bach to, in his tired, exhausted state, to improvise a six-part fugue on this particular theme, it was as if he was saying, 
Now I'd like you to put on this blindfold and play all 50 of us individual games of blindfolded chess and beat us all. <laughs> and Bach saw the way the wind was blowing and he didn't want to play this game. And he said, I'm sorry, I, uh, I'm not prepared to do that. I'll improvise you a six part fugue on a theme of my own choosing, which he did. Then the evening ran down, he went back to his son's lodgings, rested up from this very long day. The next morning, the king's emissary returned, said the king would like to invite you to come and sample the great organs of Potsdam. So he went back down into central Potsdam. They went from church to church and the king invited, which is to say commanded Bach to play recitals on them. Presumably at the end of the day, he bounced his grandchild on his knee for a few minutes, got back in the coach and headed back down to Leipzig. And on the way back down, he began to plot out his response to these days in Potsdam, or if you prefer, his revenge. <laughs> and as soon as he got out of the coach, he wrote out this C minor three-part fugue that we just heard a bit of. And then he spent the next two weeks writing at breakneck speed, and he produced a 16-part suite of just about an hour of music, all based on the king's royal theme packaged it up, had it printed out, sent it back to the king. The king had it in his hand, completely printed with a dedication on July the 7th, 1747, exactly two months after Bach had visited. And it has a dedication. And you remember that the king spoke French. He didn't like to speak German. He may not have spoken it very well. Bach spoke enough French to write a very obsequious dedication to the Margrave of Brandenburg and the dedication to the uh, Brandenburg Concertos. He wrote this particular dedication in German. <laughs> he said, most gracious king, your majesty's command was my most humble duty. But I soon noticed that for lack of necessary preparation, the result was not as good as such an excellent subject demanded. Thereupon, I resolved and promptly pledged myself to work out this right royal theme more perfectly and then to make it known to the world. This undertaking has now been carried out as well as possible. <laughs> bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> He's not saying, I beg your consideration. He's saying, here it is. And of course, it begins with this three-part fugue we just heard. And then he gives the king the six-part fugue that he had asked for. Interestingly, however, he doesn't call the three or six-part fugues fugues. He calls them richer cars. This is an Italian term, a rather antique term for strict counterpoint of the kind that the king doesn't like so much. And uh, it allowed Bach to make one of these very complicated, clever, punning acrostic puzzles in Latin, which, as you see, translates to by the king's command, the theme is resolved with canonic art. Also, by calling these richer cars, he is hearkening back to his polyphonic predecessors. And he was quite a scholar of his predecessors. He knew the music of Palestrina and of Frescobaldi to the point where he had copied out a lot of their music and studied it. I'm going to play you two minutes of the six-part fugue. It lasts over 10. But it takes two minutes for him to introduce the royal theme in all six voices. And as you hear and see it go by, I think you'll understand why Bach did not want to take a chance on simply improvising one of these on the evening of May 7th. 
as you hear, he's taken this theme that Schoenberg pronounced counterpoint proof, and he has parlayed it into one of the most spiritually exalted, blindingly intricate, and yet transparently beautiful examples of contrapuntal art that he or anybody else ever wrote. And on a strictly human level, it probably was his way of saying to the king, don't screw with me, Sonny. <laughs> but then, in deference to the king's preferred style of music making and his love of the flute, he wrote a four-movement trio sonata, which again, like the fugue, the first fugue, combines his own learned style of music making with the king's preferred Rococo fashionable style of music making beautifully. And so you'll hear, for instance, in the opening Largo, the king's theme is fragmented in the bass line. You hear the basic motives clearly. And in the upper two voices, he constructs this beautiful flowing dialogue between the two voices with a lot of what you'll see uh, couplets, two sixteenth notes bound together by a slur, little sighing, effective gestures which were characteristic of the Rococo steel galant that the king liked. Play you a little of this Largo. And each of the four movements of this piece treat the royal theme in this same genre blending way. I'll play you an example from the last movement in which Bach writes a strict three-part fugue and he uses the royal theme as the basis of that fugue. But he turns it into a six-eight form and writes it in the size, in the style of a lilting gigue which would have been sure to appeal to the king's up-to-date sensibilities. And then, as the coup de grace, he takes this cannon-proof theme and he constructs ten cannons on it. <laughs> and they're divided into two different kinds of cannons. The first kind, he uses the theme itself as the basis of the cannon. And we saw an example of that early on in that crab cannon that I played for you at the beginning of the conversation. The other five use the theme as a kind of uh, Cantus firmus, around which he intertwines the tendrils of a, of a cannon. And these cannons are all constructed to solve different kinds of canonic problems. One of the more interesting ones to me is called the modulating cannon. And he includes a little message in Latin to the king, which is, as the keys ascend, so may the glory of the king. And you see this image, it looks like a two voice piece, but it's actually three. Uh, the top line is the theme in an ornamented version. The bottom line is the canon, and again, it's a puzzle canon, so he gives us various hints. We see bass clef, we also see tenor clef, which tells us that the lower line was read in bass clef in C minor, and then when it gets to the second bar, the second voice comes in, starting at the beginning, read in tenor clef, so it's read in G minor. I'll play you the whole thing. And what's fascinating about this piece is that it very subtly and almost imperceptibly modulates up a whole step every time it goes around in a circle. So it takes six times through it in order for it to come from C minor back to C minor. It goes C minor to D minor to E minor every time it revolves around. And yet, although I've written it in so you can see where it happens, 
If you close your eyes, you won't notice because it's done so artfully. It's almost like an oral illusion. <laughs> There's a book uh, by an author named Douglas Hofstetter called Gödel Escher Bach. Anybody read that book? I tried to. <laughs> um, I read the beginning of it, and there's a <laughs> there's a description at the beginning of a phenomenon that he calls the strange loop, which is the phenomenon that takes place when you've got a hierarchical system in which you've got rising or descending elements and somehow miraculously at the end of the loop they come back to where they began. And he draws a parallel as a demonstration of the strange loop phenomenon between this modulating canon and some of the impossible buildings by M.C. Escher. Uh, particularly the one called Waterfall where you've got this image of the water cascading down, turning the mill wheel, flowing downstream and somehow miraculously coming back to the top of the waterfall. And it's a nice way of uh, comparing these two pieces. That's a footnote. In any event, you may be wondering what the king's response was to all of this. And as far as we know, he had no response whatsoever because he never acknowledged receiving it. He didn't thank Bach. As far as we know, he didn't even take it out of the box. He just gave it away. Uh, he wasn't interested. I mean, he had solved his curiosity about Bach and his organ playing, and that was all that he needed. And it probably is just as well, because if he had actually taken it out, taken it for a test drive, studied the piece, probably it would have just made him mad, because he would have realized that uh, it was written in a style he didn't like, and that it was not really a musical offering to his august self, but was really, like all of Bach's music, a musical offering to the glory of God. And also, of course, to Bach's concept of contrapuntal musical truth, which he was spending his last decade bolstering, and of which the art of fugue is the culmination. We'll talk about that in the second half, the art of fugue. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>